Cheers for joining me, Luca. Always good Hello. to catch you, mate. Good to see you. How is life treating you kind of working from home? Because I know you're, you and the team are usually based in the London office. Yeah. So how are you as a team working and with clients as well? Because obviously everyone's in the same situation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, as a business, obviously, you know, we're, we're pretty good to go as long as you arm us with a laptop. So, um, you know, as a business, we've not that been that affected as you might expect. Um, we've got, you know, 40, 40 employees. Uh, we've had, obviously, challenges that you would expect to any business operates in the live sports and event, events and entertainment industry. So, um, we've had those challenges. We've had to navigate through a lot of them, working very close with our clients. I think the key thing in, in any period of crisis is transparency and over communication. So it's about making sure that the team know exactly how the business is functioning, making sure that your clients know how you're functioning and understanding how both your people and your clients are getting through this. And ultimately it's a situation that is unprecedented. No one has anticipated it and no one's been for anything like this before. So it's really just about coming together and, and being clear and open with, with how you deal with it. I know you've always been a big fan of kind of utilizing productivity tools. What are you using at the moment? What's working well for you guys? I'd say I wish I'd invested in Slack. I wish I'd bought shares in Slack. I've seen their share price go through the roof. Or Zoom. Um, I, I read an interesting post from the CEO of Slack where, uh, he put on Twitter, this, there was this whole thread where he talked about how from February onwards, they were seeing, okay, 1,000 new users a day, uh, then 100,000 new, and now they're into like million new companies joining on everyday basis. So um, it's pretty cool to see. Um, obviously, we, we use the Google App Suite. So we use Google Hangouts on a daily basis as part of our tools, but then usual tools that we've always been using. So tools like Trello, um, we have a training platform called Trainial, which allows us to to share information on onboarding with our clients and our team. But like I said, like when you're a digital business and you are um, operating from a, a laptop and everyone's got a MacBook anyway, um, it's very it's pretty similar to a normal day's work for us as a business, um, albeit we we aren't in an office and you have to appreciate that some of your team are don't have the fortunate circumstances that some of us have of having access to a garden. And some of your team uh, are in shared accommodation with five or six other people in, in a small room. So we have to do what we can to make it as easy as possible for people to do, do their jobs. But um, it, it, from all extended purposes, we, we're, we're able to operate as business as usual. And going back the last couple of months, when did you first kind of get an inkling that things were about to change in a big way? Well, I think we, the first time we, we obviously heard about this was in December, but it didn't really uh, affect us directly as a business until, I'd say until February was it, was when we first started tracking how this was moving through from Asia and then in, into Italy. Now, we do a lot of work in Italy. We've got football club clients in Italy and it was mid-February, I think, that we started having conversations with them about this is this is already starting to to affect them particularly um clients like milan in the north of italy where this was starting to to grow um it didn't then impact on the wider business until early march i'd say when we started getting the conversations with a lot of our live events clients who were talking about potentially having to um, push back certain briefs. And this at that point was not about canceling their season. That was more about um, briefs that we'd had planned are going to be pushed back while we wait to see what happens with this. And then obviously as this developed, that evolved into briefs being canceled, scope of works being put on pause. Yeah, it must be a mad time. So I know a lot of your business is built around trying to get bums on seats. In essence, you know, utilizing the latest tools, utilizing advertising. Mm. How have you managed to kind of pivot that and still keep the money coming in and keeping everyone busy? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good question. Um, 
it's it's a challenging time i think us as a business um so we are we're naturally we're a, we're a performance marketing agency and we focus on direct to consumer and there's five core pillars of our world and ultimately within the direct consumer world within sports so we have the live events sector which is largely driven by event ticketing and that's not just not just stadium or venue owners but also that's the likes of mass participation and the race registrations for um, running swimming cycling triathlon events so you have the live event sector you have retail that we do a lot of you have the um, audience development programs which are all about building the fan bases in both owned and operated platforms and also within the earned platforms. You have sponsorship and then you have um, OTT and SBOD and VOD. So those are kind of five areas that we work across. And for the, for the last three years, live events has been the biggest area of those five areas. And when that comes to a shuddering halt, you then have to assess um, your entire business. So you've got a lot of clients that are completely dependent on their live event schedule, particularly the national governing bodies we work with. They are entirely dependent on the live event schedule and they don't have a lot of the other initiatives. They don't have a retail product. They don't have a OTT, VOD or SBOD. Um, their sponsorship is based around their live events. Their TV money is based around their live events. And then that's a small portion of our client pool. So that's immediately creative challenges. But then you have other clients that are much more driven by media and audience development. So you've got clients like FIFA that we work with, and we've got a campaign called the World Cup at Home, which is completely based on exactly as what it says on the tin. It's building um, the premise of a, of a World Cup so that people feel that there's live sports happening and that's attacking the archive um, from 1970 onwards and pulling out live games and allowing people to vote for them. Then you have the work we do with the UFC and the Fight Pass product and it's very much built around, okay, how can we take the programming we've got and the archive we've got to tell stories in what is a, a time where people are craving content. But again, it's, it's a real mixture of and the challenges are there. Um, as a business, as all businesses, um, you have to, when you go through any period of crisis, you have to first assess your home. You have to look at, you know, essentially your housekeeping and that's, you know, cash flow, um, business and operations, staff. Uh, you have to just make sure you get all of those things in place. So we did that quite early. And fortunately, you know, the government's been able to support. So particularly where we've had team members that are working on accounts that have pretty much gone to a halt, we've been able to, to allow those people to, to go on furlough, as a lot of businesses probably have, allowing us to have a core team of people that can operate around um, existing clients, business development, being able to package what we're doing for clients that are really seeing great success right now and tell those stories so that other companies who are maybe not sure of how they can find um, opportunities within the adversity, we can certainly help them with that. So how are you helping with the governing bodies with the teams that might not be so, so prepared or are looking to you for advice mm. on, okay, we're in this situation, how, what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What have you seen that's kind of they're asking and also what's kind of working, not working? Well, a lot of it is, a lot of it's about uncertainty, right? So the first thing is you do, as a business, you know, the first thing I'm going to do when I look at any form of crisis, I want to know how long is this crisis going to last? And you want to consume as much information as possible yeah, no. <laughs> to, be able to give you um, an understanding. And from then you've got to look at your, you've got to look at your balance. You've got to look at your bank balance and you've got to know, do we have enough money to see ourselves through this scenario? And that's what all businesses have to do. And if you've got the cash flow to go through, you'll be fine. You can look at the government and they're providing the, the Sybil's loans to be able to help businesses get through. So once you've established that your business is, is going to be able to get through, then you can start to look at what we can do right now is what, what we're calling a COVID product. So what can we do right now? And knowing that we could be in this for a long period of time, we want to be in a position that we might have gone into this period um, weak, but we certainly want to come out of this stronger. And we want to be able to say to our clients, the problems that you might have had before this hit are going to exist, if not worse, after. So what can we do right now to put you in a better state? So we're doing a lot of that. And that's auditing 
their work. It's looking at what we call digital health check. It's looking at the digital plumbing of their entire ecosystem, how things are tagged up, how they currently produce content, how they currently engage with their audience. And that's largely about just building an understanding of what we've done and how can we be better. Then there's that whole piece around audience and audience development and audience engagement. And for, particularly for those challenged national governing bodies, clubs and teams, they are, the, the, the biggest for them is about how they can make sure they still have revenue coming in. And that's probably going to be from commercial partners. Now, there are commercial partners and brands out there that are still looking and they're craving for where can they put their brand right now if there's no live events. Well, they can still buy that audience because that audience is still there. There just needs to be somebody publishing the right content to engage that audience. So there is a, there is a, a portion of our clients that are still operating, are still developing content, and are still developing audience engagement exercises to fulfill some of their sponsorship requirements. And there's some of that, especially on the sponsorship front. You have big events, you know, talking to Jim at the FA, you know, they should have been playing at the Euros this summer. That's not going to happen, but you've still got big brands who are expecting big rights and suddenly digital is the only platform in which to activate it. You know, they've got the football is staying home. A lot of it's presented by and it's kind of accelerated a lot of the plans they had around branded content anyway mm. into a three week period rather than a two year period. Right. But, you know, there's a lot that's going to go on to that now to avoid losing money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I think that the, uh, some of the things that a crisis does is it, it, it removes all of the fluff and all of the things that weren't your priorities and it allows you to focus. A lot of businesses go into a crisis and they come out of it um, in a better place than, than, than they were before because it's allowed them to focus on what matters. It allows them to focus on how they can take the core of their product and know how to scale it. Um, for us as a business, that's kind of always been our premise anyway. When, when you're a performance marketing business, you're always looking at how you can generate business outcomes. And if, you, if you're then building from that to develop campaigns about awareness and engagement, then that's what you need to do to funnel that audience through to an outcome. But now it's saying, okay, well, if you've never developed a retail proposition, then is now a good time to do that? So we have teams of people that are specialists in Amazon and building Amazon stores, which are very quick, very easy to develop, that you can have a go-to-market e-commerce solution very quickly. And then it's looking at what do you have in the form of, of um, retail or merchandise that you could develop for them. So it's looking at initiatives that can help you um, to generate new revenue streams in this time. And that's for for um, the majority of what we're doing it's kind of split into these different buckets because you've got you've got clients that want to do nothing right now because they just do not know if they're going to make it through and a lot of businesses won't and we can't beat around the bush on that the, you're going to see some um, casualties in the sports industry some governing bodies probably won't come through this so there is a portion of our clients that you've just got to be very sensitive and be supportive of how we can help them. And we do a lot of work pro bono for our clients. You know, don't, don't have any illusions here. We're not talking about everything we're doing is about charging you charging fees. We want to help our clients come through this. So it's making sure that we can provide whatever we can to help them. And that's one portion. The second is those clients that are on the fence that are somewhat paralyzed by this. They're not sure what to do. They might have furloughed a load of their staff and they don't have their internal strategic team to be able to do things that they wish they could do but they believe that they're going to be okay that's where we can certainly help them when we can we can accelerate that process for them being able to to develop content and be able to reach new audiences and generate new revenue streams and then you have that portion of of customers and clients that see this as an opportunity to accelerate market share so you've got those three pockets and ultimately when you have three different types of customer base it does create a bit of a challenge for a marketing business to know how are you position it because your conversations, particularly if you're, you're one of my account managers, you might be dealing with three different customers and you have to wear three different hats on a daily basis. So it's a very challenging time. And that's why as a business, we have to have a lot of communication, 9am check-ins every day as a team, fully transparent, over communicating to them on how we're operating and then communicate it again at the end of every day to see how people are doing both mentally and how they're doing in terms of business.
yeah that's definitely a really really important one because yeah I'm, I'm five weeks in of sitting around my house and it's there is a certain amount of sanity that you need to keep and I think part of that over communication and keeping checking in with the teams is definitely part of that and I think it could be something that comes out of this is the whole working from home isn't a something that's done by a minority and you're kind of left to do your own thing and Jim was again quite transparent in the fact that before you know people go away a day a week and it was a time to go and check your emails or get some quiet time when that shouldn't be the case it shouldn't be your cut off from the rest of people mm. just because you're not in the office I completely agree I we've um we're currently debating about having no office after this um, offices are expensive they are uh, somewhat of a luxury and we're currently operating as a digital business if you take um, take a business like Buffer right and we, we have mutual friend that works at Buffer and you know they're a, a American based tech business that has no office they all operate remotely and something that I would have snarked at previously I would have I would have I'm always been pro office but right now I'm thinking about pro being pro people being efficient and how can we still be as effective without things that we used to have. So I think in the new world that emerges from this at a minimum, I think working from home one or two days a week will be quite normal. I'm certainly looking at having maybe a Friday every week at home with the family and just being, um, Potentially, you know, particularly now I've had more time spending with my, with my two year old. So it's, I don't want to miss that. And I don't want to, I don't want to turn the tap off and go back to, you know, five days a week, not seeing her until, um, you know, sometimes in the evening, but sometimes not till the weekend. So uh, I think we're going to see a lot of change here, but the, the important thing is, is not to put too much pressure on, on anybody right now is it is about expectation management. Everybody's going through this in their own way. Everybody has loved ones um, that they are thinking about first and foremost. Everybody has financial concerns as well. If I can alleviate some of that by saying you'll be looked after, you've got a job, look after your family and friends. If you have a work and deadline that you're worried about, pass it over to someone. Someone will pick it up. No problem whatsoever. That's the key thing. Yeah. I completely agree. I think the whole people element is something that's going to become a lot more focused and we're going to appreciate suddenly having this extra family time that we've probably not had before or felt pressured into the fact yeah. that we can't have. Um, I'm wondering, is that, do you think that will translate over into the content that's being produced as well? Because I think purpose is something that comes up. You know, If you're not doing something that connects with your fans, your audience, and it's less about let's just get a message out there and just broadcast it because we need to. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I, I pivoted the business in 2016. You know, bef when I set up the business in 2012, it was largely about getting to market quickly and having an offering to the sports industry that was focused on digital and focused on, on social media. And when you set up a business, you often, you have an idea, but you don't really know how that will, um, how that will deliver, deliver success in a long period of time. You just want to be, um, active almost the line is execution is the strategy when it got to 2016 and we were having clients saying to us what is the outcome of all of this great content what is the outcome of having 20 30 million people on social media and if you can't answer it without having to divert back to media value and you know this is a community of people and your community is valuable when there are lots of holes in the questioning about the value of that community and about the value of of um, this to a potential partner it meant that we had to shift towards something that was very easy this is the tangible outcome this is how much money we're generating this is how many how many people in your database of a high quality audience from top 10 15 markets this is the value so now we're into a point where value of everything is going to be scrutinized Sponsorship is, has for a long time been a luxury of a way of advertising around something that's emotive as opposed to trying to buy that person's consumer and that person's attention. And almost you're trying to interrupt their experience. Instead, sponsorship allows you to be part of the experience. That whole piece now is up for debate and question. 
we already saw Fortune 100 and for, Fortune 250 brands remove themselves from sponsorships over the last 10 years, right? For what you used to see, the big brands on the shirts, right? You used to see Coca-Cola and Carlsberg and McDonald's be doing um, regular sponsorships. And then they said they moved just to Olympic sponsors. And you saw the likes of Samsung move off their sponsorships and go just to Olympic sponsors. And you, you saw the make way through the challenger brands as, as, a, as a way to get into sponsorship. Well, now we're going to see that go right down to it being just about content and distribution. How effective are you going to be with this piece of content? And how effective is that going to be against my business objectives? So if I'm an automotive brand, is this sponsorship going to increase test drives? Yes or no? And if I can afford the luxury of an awareness campaign, then great. But if I can't, I'm not going to do it. And the same with every other industry. So for anyone that specializes in, is in content, the question about, you know, the, the old Simon Sinek, you know, start with why, it's probably never been more pertinent. And you're going to see a lot of that in sports. And I think that's really going to wake up a lot of suppliers and a lot of rights holders about, the luxury that they've been packaging for, for the longest period to, to their brands is probably going to be a bit, is going to lead a bit more strategic thought now about how they make something more valuable. And as to your point, purpose driven. I suppose the other point of that is kind of around esports as well, which I always kind of end up sticking on the end of these you conversations. Always end up with esports. Esports. <laughs> All right, it's off. <laughs> so Run out of juice. <laughs> is around esports and you know it it has suddenly come to the fore even more it was growing anyway this has kind of given it an extra massive boost mm. especially around sim racing and fifa um with those ones and the governing bodies getting behind it i mean this is presumably going to put extra pressure on governing bodies to this is how another industry is working and possibly doing things better than we are yeah, I mean, there's, there's many things when it comes to eSport that people were flagging about it. It's unregulated, you know, as a starting point. It's, um, it doesn't have a track record or a blueprint as such for how you build commerce or how you build um, value. Ultimately, what you're seeing with eSport is you're seeing something that's on when everything else is off right now. And the notion of, of fan engagement and sports marketing is built around... Um, groups of people that emotionally are connected to these entities. Now, if that attention and that emotion then gets attached to something else, because you can't go to the cinema, so you can't watch any live film, you can't go to a music concert, and you can't go to a sporting event. So eventually, that attention is going to find its way to something where people are going to fill that void. There's only so much Netflix you can watch before there's any original programming and there is no more original programming because companies can't produce any content right now. So esports has become somewhat as a beacon of light for this, um, this spectrum of, we have audience, do you want to buy audience? And brands always want to buy eyeballs and rights holders and publishers always want to sell eyeballs. So esports will emerge as certainly as it has done. You know, I had a conversation just this morning with, with someone from Gfinity and they're, they're seeing success in this, in the work they're doing with various companies, one of them being Formula One. And it's ultimately, it's going to come down to um, esports will continue to grow, but it's always needed a, a bit of an accelerated push from various entities. You saw the Premier League develop the, the e Premier League last year, but almost as a bit of a soft sell, as if to say, if this doesn't work, um, you won't remember it, that it was attached to us. Yeah. Like, when, like when Google develop a product and you forget that they developed anything that, that was really poor, which they've done hundreds of times. But the Premier League kind of developed this, but kind of didn't, didn't pretend like it was a big singing and dancing thing. Um, esports provides an opportunity for brands to get involved. It provides an opportunity for you to build audience attention. Um, there's still going to be a lot of companies that are slow to slow to the market as they are with everything. But I think for those companies that take advantage of where that audience is right now, there's going to be some, some market share to gain. No, it's definitely, I mean, you look at the likes of Torquay sports who specialize in the sim racing side, doing a multi-year deal with ESPN and you see, you know, NBC carrying esports, Fox carrying esports. 
these things aren't just going to kind of, yes, they're not going to be at the same level as they are now, but they're not going to disappear. So everyone's going to be fighting for a limited amount of marketing and ad budget at the end of all this. So mm-hmm. it's going to be an interesting, and I think those ones that adapt will survive, and those ones that stick to the old methods are going to be left behind. Yeah, agree. Cool. Always a pleasure catching up with you, mate. And love seeing, love seeing what you've done with WePlay and how you've grown it over the years. Always, always very proud to watch. Yeah, pleasure, mate. I'm glad to, uh, always good to catch up. Um, and yeah, to those, to those people watching, stay safe, stay healthy. Look after one another.